will continue with the topic of uh, adsorption. It, the adsorption can be done either in a batch mode or in a continuous mode. So, if it is a batch mode what you do is you take your adsorbent you mix it up thoroughly with the broth the fermentation broth or the solution containing the solute or the adsorbate that needs to be recovered mix them thoroughly and then you filter it out. So, your adsorbate or the solute would have been adsorbed in the adsorbent. So, the concentration of the solute would have gone down in the feed and some amount of solute would have been taken up by the adsorbent. So, there are two streams entering the particular stage of batch process and there are two streams leaving the same stage. So, one stream relates to the solution or the broth which contains the solute or the adsorbate, the other stream contains your adsorbent. Generally, the adsorbent will not have any solute that means, the adsorbent may be very fresh. So, you will not have any solute. So, in that particular case the concentration of the solute or the adsorbate will be 0. Now, there will be two streams that will be leaving this particular stage. One stream is your uh, broth which will have a reduced amount of the solute or the adsorbate and the other one is your uh, solid adsorbent which would have taken up quite a lot of the solute. So, we need to do a ba mass balance of this particular stage. So, the amount of um, solute entering in this stream as well as in this stream, the amount of solute leaving in this particular stream as well as in this particular stream. So, you need to just balance these four terms and that will give you a mass balance for the solute which is given by this. So, like I explained in the previous class, we have uh, X f is the concentration of the solute or the adsorbate f is your feed solution um, and similarly you have x that is the concentration of the solute or adsorbate leaving and f again is your feed solution. We will assume that there is no change in the amount of the feed solution and then similarly you are adding a adsorbent of a quantity w uh, with certain concentration of the solute already adsorbed on the adsorbent, but generally if you are taking a fresh adsorbent Q of will be 0 and on the right hand side we have again another term this is the amount of uh, adsorbent leaving the stage and this is the concentration of the solute or the adsorbate that has been taken up by the adsorbent. So, we have these uh, four terms and this is called the operating line. So, we can um, use this particular line for many purposes we can use it to calculate the amount of adsorbent required if I want to achieve certain efficiency that means, I want to recover 90 percent of uh, a protein how much of uh, um, adsorbent I need to add or on the contrary I may say that I have certain amount of adsorbent mixed with the broth what will be the percentage recovery. So, I can use it for that type of calculation also. Now, I also mentioned that uh, you have something called the isotherm. There are three types of isotherms which we talked about the linear isotherm, the Freudlich isotherm and the Langmuir isotherm. So, if you look at uh, the isotherm for a linear and the x axis has your x, x is the concentration of the solute or the adsorbate in the broth and the q is the concentration um, of the same solute in the adsorbent the x and the q are in equilibrium. They can form different types of equilibrium either a linear relation or a Freudlich or a Langmuir. So, in the case of a linear you are going to have a relation like this and uh, the operating line which contains terms like uh, the amount of uh, slurry, the amount of uh, broth you are adding, the quantity of adsorbent you are adding, the concentration of uh, your uh, um, solute in the slurry or in the um, broth and the concentration of the solute that is leaving. So, this is the equilibrium line which I ta talked about in the previous slide. So, the equi equilibrium line will generally look like this. So, this is your isotherm relationship this is given, given as q equal to k x. So, 
wherever it is cutting that will be the value of x for a given set of f w and q f and x f. Okay. So, graphically also we can solve this particular equation and the linear e equation to get what will be the concentration of the solute or the adsorbate after the adsorption process understand. So, that is for the case of linear isotherm. Suppose I have a Freudlich isotherm you know the isotherm looks like this we mentioned it about couple of classes back if you recall and again the operating line is going to be in the same way okay. the operating line is this particular relation and wherever they are cutting is where determines the concentration of your solute in the um, slurry at the end of the adsorption process and uh, the concentration of the solute um, in the adsorbent at the end of the process. So, graphically also all I have to do is I draw the Freudlich isotherm, I draw the equilibrium line and I will see where it cuts. If I want to solve it numerically again it is like two equations are there I can substitute them and then I can use them. Now, let us go to the third uh, isotherm that is the Langmuir isotherm um, as you recall Langmuir isotherm looks like this right x axis is x and y axis is q. Langmuir isotherm assumes a monolayer adsorption. So, after some time the number of sites available for adsorption is 0 that means all the sites are blocked. So, whatever be your extra concentration of the um, solute in the slurry the quantity of q is not going to increase. So, it will flatten out and once again it will have an operating line. So, this is where the determine you can determine what will be the value of x and q using this particular graphical method. And again if you recall the Langmuir isotherm equation is q equal to k into x divided by some another constant plus x. So, Langmuir isotherm will have two constants linear isotherm will have one constant and Freudlich isotherm will have two constants because there will be an exponent term also. Again uh, we talked about it uh, two classes back. So, you need to check from your old notes to see the equation for linear Freudlich and Langmuir isotherm. So, this is one way of solving um, these two equations in a graphical way. You draw the operating line which is a straight line it will be sloping downwards and then you draw your isotherm depending upon whether it is linear or Freudlich or Langmuir and then see where they cut that will give you the solutions for these two equations that will give you what will be the value of x and q. Okay. We look at some problems uh, later on um, in the end of the class or in the next class. Now, let us go to continuous stir tank again um, I just introduced this concept. Um, so, adsorption can be done either in a batch mode or in the continuous mode. So, if you look at a continuous stir tank what is happening you have the adsorbent inside like a solid uh, material um, like your activated carbon or a zeolite beads or a, uh, silica gel beads and so on and there is an agitator here and uh, continuously you are feeding in the solution which contains your solute or the adsorbate the solute gets adsorbed and um, the stream that is leaving will have less amount of the solute. So, x will be less than x f v is the concentration of the tank. Uh, one important point um, if you are operating a continuous stir tank adsorber is you should see that uh, the adsorbent does not escape through the exit stream. So, um, there might be a, a C or a filter or a strainer put in so that these particles do not escape out. But then um, as time goes if um, attrition takes place that means if the particles become powdery they may start escaping and start going downstream. So, how do you develop a model for uh, this type of continuous adsorber it looks slightly co complicated, but it is not complicated. So, again you have to do a mass balance solute in minus solute out minus solute adsorbed is equal to accumulation solute in this is the solute in f is the flow rate of the slurry or the broth or the medium which contains your solute or the adsorbate at a concentration of x f. Okay. So, f 
into x f gives you the solute in f into x gives you the solute out. So, this is the quantity flowing out this is the concentration of the solute in the exit stream. So, this is in this is out minus amount adsorbed. So, because solute from the solution phase goes to the adsorbed phase. So, it is leaving this phase do not forget that is why you have a minus term here. Epsilon is the voidage factor that means amount of voids. So, 1 minus epsilon gives you amount of solids and V is your volume of the vessel and R adsorbed. R adsorbed is the rate of adsorption. So, this term represents the rate of adsorption of the solute from the liquid phase to the solid phase. So, this is solute into the react vessel adsorber, solute out of the adsorber, this is the amount adsorbed and um, that means amount leaving the solution phase moving to the solid phase. This is equal to accumulation okay? that is why you have d x by d t, t is the time. So, this is the accumulation of the solute inside the vessel. After a long time when all the solid adsorber is saturated with the liquid there would not be any accumulation at all remember, but initially as these solids get adsorbed on to your uh, adsorb adsorbent you are going to have accumulation taking place uh, in the vessel actually. So, this is a typical mass balance type of uh, equation this is called an unsteady state equation it is not a steady state it is an unsteady state equation um, because it does not still reach steady state. Steady state means with respect to time all the parameters are equal to 0 that is a steady state. Unsteady state means the um, parameters um, are still varying with respect to time that is why on the left hand side you have d x by d t. So, this is an unsteady state mass balance equation and uh, this is an ordinary differential equation. Okay. So, this is an ordinary differential equation so, and d x by d t. So, it is a first order differential equation. Now, your r adsorbed can be a linear it could be non-linear. Okay. So, it can be a linear differential equation or it can be a non-linear differential. Suppose, I if, if it contains a um, Langmuir type of isotherm then you will have x in the numerator and denominator if you recall. Okay. Whereas, if it is a linear then uh, you will have just q equal to k x. So, then it this becomes a linear ordinary first order differential equation. Now, how do you solve this you can solve it uh, either um, analytically if the differential equation is easy to be solved analytically then we can get a mathematical relation between the time and x that means how the x varies with time or q varies with time, but if it becomes very complicated we may not be able to do it analytically then we may have to use some numerical techniques like uh, MATLAB or uh, Mathematica or some other software to solve the differential equation that is a numerical approach actually. We will take a very simple case and uh, we will try to see whether we can solve this. Okay. Now, there is another important point you need to consider that is the rate of adsorption. Now, the solute is in the liquid phase that means the adsorbate is in the liquid phase now it has to go to the solid phase. So, you have a liquid solid interface. So, there is there has to be a mass transfer taking place of the solute the solute has to move from the liquid to the solid phase. So, all chemical engineers know that when there is a phase um, interface between a solid and a liquid or a solid and a gas or a liquid and a gas then there is something called a mass transfer. So, that is what um, is uh, going to happen. So, there has to be a diffusion of your solute from the liquid phase going uh, going to your solid phase and that rate is given by the driving force that is the concentration driving force x is the concentration of the solute in the liquid phase x star is the concentration in the solution which will be in equilibrium with the adsorbent because ultimately the solute is in equilibrium um, in the solid phase and in the liquid phase okay, because it is an isotherm that is the x minus x star is a driving force 
k l is called the mass transfer coefficient, a is the interfacial area that is the interfacial area between the liquid and the solid. So, if a is very large your, your rate of adsorption is also going to be very large, if a is very small then rate of adsorption will be small. Similarly, driving force x minus x star is large rate of adsorption will be very large. K L is the mass transfer coefficient we can calculate uh, doing uh, experiments and there are many experiments available and chemical engineering techniques are available which can help you to calculate K L. Okay. Now, how do you calculate x star? x star is as I said concentration of solute in the solution which would be in equilibrium with the adsorbent. This is nothing but the adsorption isotherm. So, x star and q will have a mathematical relation, it can be a linear relation that is linear isotherm, it could be a Freudlich type of relation or it could be a Langmuir relation. We will take a linear case. So, if you take a linear adsorption isotherm, then q will be equal to k x star. Okay. So, instead of x star which is an unknown we can substitute as q by k. So, the differential equation will have d x by d t and all the terms will be respect to x and q. So, we will be and similarly we can develop another differential equation for d q by d t that is the concentration of the solute in the adsorbed phase just like uh, this equation we will be able to get d q by d t and uh, the amount of uh, adsorbate on the adsorbent is happening because of the adsorption only okay. because you are not introducing any solids in the feed or no solids are leaving the effluent, but solids are present only inside that. So, for d q by d t you will have only this term present you will not have inlet feed or outlet feed for q please remember that. Okay. So, you will have a linear model if you assume a linear adsorption isotherm and uh, there are many uh, simple techniques are there which can help you to get an analytical solution. So, you can solve them and uh, you end up with uh, an equation of this type. This equation for example, sh so shows q, q means the concentration of the solute in the adsorbed phase that means on the adsorbent as a function of t. You can see t here and t here and uh, there is a exponential term. So, this particular mathematical relation tells you how the concentration of the solute in the adsorbent will vary as a function of time. And, uh, there are many parameters that are coming in here um, like uh, the flow rate of your uh, feed solution, the volume of your uh, tank, the voidage epsilon, k l the mass transfer coefficient, a the interfacial area, k the equilibrium linear adsorption isotherm equi equilibrium constant. So, all these come into the picture some way here into b and into sigma and so on. So, the it looks very very complicated, but uh, once you know how to solve a set of uh, linear ordinary differential equations you will understand why you get uh, this type of equation it is not very difficult, but we will not uh, spend time in actually solving it. Okay, how does these graphs look like as a function of time. So, your q will slowly build up because uh, um, imagine that initially you do not have any solute adsorbed on the adsorbent. So, q will be 0, but as a function of time slowly slowly the solute gets adsorbed and finally, it will reach a saturation correct. So, it will reach a plateau. Now, let us look at how the x f minus x vary that means x f is your concentration of solute in the feed next is the concentration of the solute leaving the effluent. Okay. So, x f minus x. So, initially at time equal to 0 x will be 0 okay. then slowly it will reach a shape 
in this form and again this also will flatten out. So, after some time the adsorbent does not have any capacity to adsorb the solute that is why you can see it flattens out it is not going down 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 further because the number of sites available will sort of reach a um, is fixed. So, the amount adsorbed is also fixed. Okay. Now, we looked at a batch process then we looked at a stirred tank continuous process. Let us look at a stirred tank not a stirred tank, but let us look at a tubular continuous process that means, you have a long tube and the adsorbent that the solid is packed inside the tube a long tube and your adsorbent is packed and the fluid with the solute flows in as it travels the solute gets adsorbed and the fluid is leaving with less of the solute present. So, you can have very long column, you can have very short columns depending upon the efficiency of adsorption as well as the, um, the capacity of the adsorbent to ad adsorb the solute. Okay. So, with time what happens is I will have a certain concentration of the solute inside the fluid and uh, if you see the exit stream when you have a fresh adsorbent all the solute would have got adsorbed right. After some time the solute will be so much that uh, the entire adsorbent would have got adsorbed this solute and there will be some solute will be leaving this particular tube. That means, the adsorbent would have got saturated with the solute and it will not be able to adsorb any more. So, what happens? F initially you will not find any solute because it would have got totally adsorbed and because the adsorbent is fresh and after some time what happens? You will start seeing some solute coming out of the fluid in the exit fluid and then finally, it is totally saturated the adsorbent is totally saturated with the solute there is not going to be any more adsorption. So, whatever is coming in will start going out. So, you will get a sigmoidal type of curve initially the concentration will be 0 and after some time it will start coming out. We will talk about this particular curve more in detail. So, initially your adsorbent is fresh. So, it will adsorb all the solute. So, the fluid <coughs> that is leaving will be free of any solute but after some time slowly slowly the tube adsorber is getting saturated. So, you will start seeing some uh, solute in the exit stream or in the effluent stream and finally, after some time there will not be any adsorption taking place whatever is coming in will be going out. And this particular curve is also called a breakthrough curve because uh, after some time there is going to be a breakthrough happening and your solute will start <coughs> coming out here. Okay. So, how do you model this particular tubular uh, adsorption process? Here it is a bit complicated because why? Because you have the concentration of solute varying across the length of the tube. Suppose, we call this z. So, there is going to be some d x by d z happening also that means, concentration of the solute varying with distance and you will have concentration varying with time also. So, you will end up with the partial differential equation whereas, if it is a stirred tank uh, adsorber you are having an ordinary differential equation whereas, in this particular case you are going to have a partial differential equation that is why you have terms like d x by d z that is rate of change of x as a function of z and you also have d x by d t that is rate of change of x as a function of time. So, you get a quite a complicated equation and um, I will spend some time on each one of the term. Okay. Suppose, you take uh, a small section of uh, your uh, tubular adsorber. So, you are you are going to have uh, the fluid entering here fluid leaving here and the solute 
is also entering, solute is also leaving. Solute is getting absorbed in the absorber by the adsorbent. Okay. And this is of cross section A. So, the velocity will be equal to flow rate divided by epsilon here, uh, sorry A here. And there is also going to be some voidage that means void fraction in the bed. So, 1 minus epsilon will tell you the fraction of the solids or the adsorbent. So, having said that, let us again go back to the same uh, equation which describes the adsorption process in a tubular uh, adsorber. Dx by dt as I talked about in the stirred tank adsorber is the accumulation term. Dx by dz comes because of the flow, because uh, there is a flow of solution through the tube. So, the concentration moves along the distance of the tube. So, you have a term which is because of the flow and then you also have a term which arises because of diffusion. So, the solute is also diffusing in apart from flowing in it is also diffusing in. So, you have a term called capital D, d square x by d square z. This term represents the diffusion process or the diffusion coefficient. So, d is the diffusion coefficient of the solute in that solution. Okay. So, you can have solutes which will be highly diffusing or you can have solutes which will be slowly diffusing. So, the diffusion coefficients will depend upon several, several parameters, the size of the solute, uh, the mass of the solute, um, the viscosity of the fluid, the temperature and so on actually. Okay. There are many relationships, mathematical relationships which can be used to calculate the diffusion coefficient d. Um, gases have certain diffusion coefficients, proteins have diffusion coefficient, salts have diffusion coefficient, small molecules and metabolites have diffusion coefficients and they depend upon the, uh, the medium through which it is flowing. Highly viscous medium diffusion will be very poor. Okay. So, this term represents the diffusion, this term represents the flow or the bulk movement and this term represents the adsorption of the solute to the adsorbent just like uh, in your uh, continuous uh, stir tank if you remember we had a negative term. So, this term represents the flow, this term represents diffusion, this term represents the movement of the solute or the adsorbate from the continuous phase or your solution to the solid phase okay. and uh, all these are equated and on the left hand side we have the accumulation. So, please recall your uh, um, stirred tank system and a tubular system. In a stirred tank system, we had uh, accumulation equal to material entering minus material leaving minus material or the solute transferred from the liquid phase to the solid phase. So, here we are having accumulation on the left hand side and then um, movement of the solute because of the flow and um, movement because of diffusion and uh, the transfer of the solute from the liquid to the solid phase. So, this is called a partial differential equation because um, we have both the um, variation of z as well as a t. So, this is called a partial differential equation. Okay. So, it is not very easy for us to solve this type of equation generally. Um, these types of equations can be solved numerically very easily with using uh, certain numerical packages um, and it becomes quite cumbersome. So, we can do certain assumptions and using certain assumptions we can get certain relationships for the breakthrough curve. Okay. Um, as I said initially you have a bed containing fresh adsorbent. So, the feed is entering with the solute. So, the bed is fresh. Um, so, whatever solute or the uh, adsorbate present will get completely adsorbed. So, the stream that is leaving the tube will not contain any adsorbate or the solute. Okay. So, it will not contain any adsorbate. So, the exit concentration of the solute x will be 0 for some time. Suddenly, after some time, 
slowly slowly you will see some concentration because your adsorbent is saturating. So, as it gets saturated the concentration of the solute will start raising in the exit stream and finally, the adsorbent is completely saturated with the adsorbate. So, there is no adsorption taking place. So, whatever is entering will be leaving correct. So, this is called a breakthrough curve and this is called the breakthrough time that is the time at which you start seeing some solute concentration in the exit stream. So, this is called the breakthrough time and this is called the exhaustion time. So, this is represented by T subscript E, this is represented by T subscript B that is the breakthrough time and this is called the breakthrough concentration. So, we can say um, a concentration of 1 percent can be assigned as a breakthrough concentration. Then we can say what is the time at which you start seeing 1 percent of the feed in the exit stream. So, if this is your feed, if it is 1 percent, it may be here. What is the time at which you start seeing 1 percent of the feed in the exit stream? That can be fixed as a breakthrough time. You do not need um, to keep it as 1 percent, you may keep it at 2 percent or you may keep it at 0.5 percent. So, that is left to you to keep it. So, based on your x b that is the breakthrough concentration um, you will know at what time this particular breakthrough is going to happen. So, this is a very very important uh, information because uh, if you are operating a tubular adsorber. So, as soon as the breakthrough happens you do not want to continue your adsorption because the adsorption is going to be now inefficient. So, you will stop your adsorption process, you will regenerate that means, you will again freshen up the adsorbent that means, whatever material has been adsorbed will be desorbed and uh, once it is again available for the adsorption you may again go back and use it. So, most of the tubular design contains two tubes, one will be performing the adsorb adsorption process whereas, other one will be getting regenerated. So, once the first one is fully saturated or there is a breakthrough, you stop the uh, fluid flow through that particular tube and then you switch over to the second tube and then in the first tube you start regenerating. And we talked about the various methods for regenerating your uh, um, adsorbent, we can use uh, high temperature or we can use acids or we can use uh, some oxidation type of approach or even reduction type of uh, processes all these will help you to regenerate your adsorbent and then it will be ready to um, perform certain absorption. So, you need to know how long can I run my column so that it reaches the breakthrough. Okay. So, that is a very important design operating uh, procedure. So, if you look at this breakthrough, so it is happening at certain time you start seeing some concentration of the fluid in the exit stream. And this is called the equilibrium zone and this is called the adsorption zone okay. and mainly from z equal to 0 going right up to z equal to l into 1 minus delta t by t b is uh, your equilibrium zone where delta t is t by t b and the adsorption zone is given by L into delta T by T B that means, delta T is T E by T B where L is your bed length. So, these two zones are given by these two relationship the equilibrium zone is L into 1 minus delta T by T B and the adsorption zone is L into delta T by T B. So, basically you would like to have a very very short adsorption zone and you would like to have a very very long equilibrium zone. That means, if the equilibrium zone is very large I can adsorb more of the solute using the same amount of adsorbent. Okay. So, you would like a graph like this quickly rising up, you do not like a graph where it is rising up very very slowly understand. So, you 
you would rather have a graph which quickly rises up and uh, that means the adsorption zone is very very short equilibrium zone is very very large. Whereas, if you have a very large adsorption zone and a very short equilibrium zone then that particular adsorbent is not very efficient. Okay. So, if the adsorption zone is very large that means your picture will will look like this slowly rising and going whereas, you want to quickly have it risen here and you want to have a very long equilibrium zone. So, how do you find out all these? Suppose I have a, a in my lab a small column um, packed with the adsorbent then I pass my fluid with the solute or the adsorbate and then I find out the breakthrough time and the exhaustion time. Okay. So, I find out the breakthrough time and the exhaustion time and then using this particular relationship I can calculate what is my equilibrium zone and what is my adsorption zone. Right? Very simple. So, you need to collect data in your lab using a tubular adsorber. Again you can use uh, this for uh, several other calculations. Okay. The most important is the fraction of the bed that is loaded when the breakthrough happens. Because as I said once the breakthrough happens you do not want to continue with the same tubular adsorber. You want to stop the adsorption, you want to um, regenerate your tube. Okay. So, how much fraction of the bed is loaded when the breakthrough happens? More the fraction that means more efficient, less the fraction that means it is less efficient you understand. So, I want to have a very high fraction that means closer to 1 rather than a very low fraction when the breakthrough happens. So, these are some of the relationships which you make use of one is the q at equilibrium is given by q into x f and the uh, adsorption zone contains half that much because we assume that this area this particular rectangular area is divided almost approximately by half by this relation. So, we can take this is equal to this. So, or this into 2 will be equal to this. So, these are some approximations which we can make use of. By doing all these we end up with the fraction of the bed which is loaded when the breakthrough happens theta is equal to 1 minus delta t divided by 2 b. Delta t is nothing but t minus t b, t b is your breakthrough time, t is your exhaustion time. So, once you calculate the exhaustion time and the breakthrough time in your small lab adsorber you can calculate theta and see how large theta is is it closer to 1 0 0.8 0 0.85 then it is very good. But if you have less like 0 0.5 that means only 50 percent of the bed is fully loaded when the breakthrough happens that means other 50 percent is not serving purpose. And again after breakthrough you do not want to run the adsorber um, so you need to regenerate that means after every 50 percent uh, loading you are regenerating your adsorber which is not very efficient. Whereas, if uh, the theta is 0.85 that means after 85 percent of loading you are regenerating your adsorber which is good. That is why you want to have your theta to be fairly large almost 0.85. So, if it is small then obviously, that particular adsorbent is not very efficient you need to change your adsorber. So, instead of using a very complicated partial differential equation which we sh showed a couple of slides back which contains diffusion coefficient which contains d square x by d z square and d x by d t and so on. Um, the whole process can be simplified based on the breakthrough. So, by just looking at the breakthrough time and the exhaustion time we can calculate the fraction of the bed which is loaded when the breakthrough happens which is given by this relation theta equal to 1 minus delta t by 2 t b where delta t is t e minus t b. We can tell how efficient is your adsorbent in a tubular um, design and if it is not very efficient we may plan to replace it with some other adsorbent. We will again look at some problems uh, during the course of uh, this uh, particular downstream process. So, in commercial downstream process of protein for example, if I want to purify a protein 
um, after the maybe fermentation you may have uh, cell debris, cells and the protein and we cannot directly go to a chromatograph because it becomes very inefficient. Chromatograph may um, get denatured um, or uh, become inefficient because of presence of so many um, unwanted uh, material. Sometimes centrifugation or filtration may be very expensive in very large scale and uh, if you know the target protein and you know what type of adsorbent that can be used for uh, adsorbing this protein, then that process becomes very, very efficient. So, adsorption can be resorted to in such a situation. Sometimes we can use a stirred tank adsorber like I showed about or we can even use fluidized bed adsorber. Just like a packed bed adsorber, we can use fluidized bed. That means, uh, the adsorbent is in a very fluid state, it is in motion. When you put in very high velocities of flow rate, then um, you can have the entire adsorbent in a fluidized state. But one main disadvantage um, in this type of uh, fluidized bed or packed bed adsorption is that there is a poor adsorption efficiency because um, the solids are uh, stationary, um, the continuous phase the liquid is moving. So, the adsorption efficiency is very low uh, leading to low productivity because of mass transfer effects actually. So, what do you have to do? We may have to recycle the feed stream. So, we do the adsorption once and then take the effluent again put it back in the feed. So, we may have to do it two or three or many times so that you get a um, complete uh, recovery of the protein of interest for you. There is another concept which is called the expanded bed, just like packed bed, you can also have an expanded bed. Expanded bed is almost like an intermediate to fluidized bed, whereas in fluidized bed, the entire solid material is in a very turbulent and a fluid state, whereas in a packed bed, the solid adsorbent is totally packed and there is no motion. So, basically, um, you achieve the expanded bed based on modifying the flow rate. So, the bed gets slowly expanded so that mixing is better, um, the adsorption that is taking place also is more efficient here. So, there is now more interest in this particular type of approach that is called the expanded bed. So, how do you make this particular expanded bed? You will have very large heavier adsorbent beads at the bottom and then you put in medium type beads later and then finally, at the top you will have very, very small beads. Okay. So, by doing this you are increasing the stability of the bed and you are also preventing undesired circulation of these beads. Otherwise, these beads will start coming out and start moving with the fluid, which is not uh, very, very um, desirable. So, ordinary resins which are used in a packed bed are not very good for expanded bed adsorption. We need to select the adsorbent, so that you can get almost 100 percent bed expansion. That means, if the original stationary bed is say um, 10 liters, you by expanding the bed you may be able to achieve almost 20 liter of expanded bed. So, you need to put in uh, a proper adsorb adsorbent into these type of beds actually. It is used in many applications, cell wall hydrolysis, um, you will have cationic proteins, um, it can be purified using this type of expanded bed. Uh, so, here you can use a cation exchange resin for doing this particular operation actually and it has been also used in many literature examples for purifying hen leg lysozyme, equine milk lysozyme and so on. So, this uh, technique has been found to be very useful for purification. Okay. Let us look at uh, now some problems on uh, adsorption. We have talked about quite a lot of theory. We talked about uh, different types of uh, adsorbents, uh, we talked about uh, the uh, thermodynamics of the adsorption process, uh, we talked about uh, the different types of isotherms, uh, we talked about different operations like a batch, uh, like a stir tank, like a tubular uh, packed uh, bed adsorption process. We also looked at uh, the mass balance equations, 
for uh, all these process. So, let us look at a problem. So, I, I have a batch system, I need to find out how much of adsorbent I need to add, that means how much of W I need to add. Uh, the bulk uh, solution contains a 0.1 milligram per liter of the solute and I want to adsorb 90 percent of this using fresh adsorbent. Okay. And uh, the isotherm is a linear isotherm, so linear adsorption isotherm um, that means q equal to k x, where k is given by this uh, particular term 1 into 10 power minus 5 the bulk solution quantity is given 1.2 liters. I am supposed to find out how much of adsorbent I need to add to recover 90 percent starting from 0.1 milligram per liter okay, when the system follows a linear adsorption isotherm. Now, units of Q will generally be um, amount of uh, adsorbate adsorbed on certain grams or milligrams of the adsorbent. Whereas, the units of uh, x please remember will be like milligram per liter of the solution, because x relates to the concentration of the adsorbate or the solute in solution, whereas q relates to the amount of adsorbate or solute adsorbed per gram or milligram of the adsorbent. So, the units are different. So, please see this milligrams per liter, milligrams per gram. So, the con the units of k will also be correspondingly like that you know in this particular case it will take care of gram per liter, it will become grams per liter because q will be in milligrams per gram, k will be um, sorry the x will be milligrams per liter. So, k will be, yeah, okay. so the units of k should match with the units of x and the units of q. Now, we take the regular mass balance equation, you have a solute coming in because of the bulk solution you have the solute coming in from the adsorbent in this particular case it is given as 0, but uh, you can have situations where the adsorbent may contain some solute. You have two streams going out one is the uh, solution which will be containing now less of the solute and you will have the adsorbent which will have more of the solute. So, there will be four terms term 1, term 2, term 3 term 4. Now, the concentration of the um, adsorbate in the final solution will be 10 percent, because you want to adsorb 90, 90 percent agreed and your initial feed contains 0 0.1. So, 0 0.1 into 0 0.1 is 0 0.01 that will be the concentration of the solute in the exit stream. Now, this is your mass balance x f into f that is the quantity of the solute in the feed x into f that is the quantity of the solute in the exit or the effluent stream q f into w, where w is the amount of uh, adsorbent you are adding. This is the quantity of the solute coming from the adsorbent q into w, q is your concentration of the solute in the adsorbent. So, this is the quantity of the um, solute leaving with the adsorbent. And because QF is 0, you are adding fresh adsorbent. So, this will become 0 and then uh, you take uh, 0.1 is your feed, you are taking 1.2 liters of the solution. So, you have 1.2 liters here, 1.2 liters here, x is 0 0.01 and Q and x are related like this Q equal to K x, K is given and Q you can take it here um, is equal to K into x, x is equal to 0 0.01. So, you can substitute this particular term here inside this. So, all you do not know is W that is the quantity of adsorbent required um, to adsorb 90 percent of the um, solute 
in a speed. So, that gives you 108 milligrams as W. So, W is equal to 108 milligrams. That means, if I take 108 milligrams of uh, a adsorbent and I add to a solution of 1.2 liters which contains 0.1 milligrams per liter of uh, the solute of interest, 90 percent of this will get adsorbed. Assuming a linear adsorption isotherm with the k value of 1 into 10 power minus 5. You understand? So, you see if I want to perform this adsorption in my lab I by doing this particular mass balance and assuming I want to recover 90 percent of the solute, I can calculate what should be the amount of my adsorbent required. So, instead of blindly adding certain amount of adsorbent, I will know exactly if the system follows a linear relationship that I need to add 108 milligrams of this particular adsorbent assuming it follows a linear relationship. So, depending upon the relationship I may have uh, different types of equation if it is a Freud Lish I may have a x raised to the power n or if I have a Langmuir I may have a very complicated uh, equation. So, this is a linear relationship. So, I ju just introduce that into my original mass balance and I calculate my W. Okay, thank you.